from global decarbonization. So thank you, you have four, uh, one hour, not more, uh -huh. 50 minutes, one hour, and then we have the discussion. We have the discussions. Questions are okay. Okay. All right, so thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, I've been uh, coming to EPUG, uh, different, different courses in the past, and uh, it's always uh, great to see uh, your kind of profile uh, and your interest in, in, in these issues. So, as, uh, as was mentioned, as I joined the World Bank recently a year ago, and formerly I, I worked for five years at the French Development Agency. Um, this paper actually started uh, a while ago uh, by conversations between these uh, co-authors, and the initial goal was to try to understand a bit more, uh, let's say, the global imbalances, consequences of uh, global decarbonization and it took a bit of time to reach to this uh, working paper that was just uh, out of a couple of weeks ago um, because as you will see the, the question is quite broad complex uh, it's it's more of a programmatic uh, uh, paper uh, there are some quant quantitative elements into it but I think it also raises a number of questions and uh, I'm happy to discuss uh, that with you in the in the coming hour. Okay, so so this is uh, the the outline of uh, uh, my presentation for today. I'll uh, say a couple of things uh, around the initial motivation and the, the, the more focused research questions of the of the paper. Show some stylized facts uh, around this question of global decarbonization and this cross-border uh, aspects. Then we'll try to move a bit uh, at a more abstract level, trying to build uh, a taxonomy of cross-border risks uh, by building uh, archetypes of countries that will face uh, this, uh, this, this risk in a mid-transition period. I, I will define what mid-transition is in the, uh, right after. And then we'll move into uh, the more quantitative or qualitative assessments of the different channels through which uh, cross-border risks uh, and opportunities could, uh, could uh, occur. Um, so the motivation is, comes from two things. On the one hand, you have a whole lot of literature that you probably know very well about globalization, financialization, uh, increased uh, uh, trade uh, flows in the in the last decades, although this has uh, kind of uh, um, um, reached a, reached a kind of a, a top. But still, we, we, we still live in a in a, an extremely globalized economy, uh, be it in trade dimensions or financial dimensions. Uh, the productive structure also uh, has, uh, we have all experienced that in the, in the, in the past few years, is extremely vulnerable to, uh, uh, vulnerable to shocks. And at the same time, whenever you go uh, look at the IPCC reports and what's, what's in there, the kind of scenarios that are built in, in the IPCC report, it looks very much like this. So smooth transition path. Um, you look at the business as usual scenario, so that's the let's say the, the red line in terms of uh, emissions of CO2, and then you 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 build pathways that allow you uh, on paper the global economy to uh, to reach a two degrees or 1.5 degree scenario. But what happens really? What are the forces here that uh, might play uh, both a positive feedback loop or negative feedback loop effect on the pathway? This is not really uh, the focus of the analysis. So either you have these global uh, pathways that are described, or you have the national version of them. So for France, for example, you have ADEM showing scenarios, different scenarios, different pathways of decarbonization, but not looking into the different forces that could play both an accelerating factor, but also uh, on the, in the other way, um, um, a tendency to uh, to slow down or even to reverse uh, uh, the initial intentions to decarbonize the economy. 
Uh, so the research question we have is why uh, are cross-border risks and opportunities in the mid-transition an important macroeconomic and policy challenge? So we'll show uh, some status facts uh, and uh, a, a taxonomy that we apply to G20 uh, countries. Second question is about the actual channels through which these cross-border risks uh, are uh, realized and the opportunities arising from countries or sectors choosing different structural economic transformation pathways. So we'll have a uh, presentation of different channels and feedback loops and some uh, quantitative assessment uh, of some of those uh, channels. And again, it's, mo it's, it's more of a programmatic paper, so it's also a path for further uh, research and discussion. So let me start with uh, some uh, stylized facts. So actually, what we're experiencing right now is some signals of uh, the emergence of green sectors. That happens. But at the same time, the current system is still heavily, ultra-majoritarily uh, fossil-based. So we are entering what we call a mid-transition period, where you have two systems that, that are confronting each other two inconsistent systems between themselves that are uh, confronting each other. And that creates instabilities. So that's the idea. Uh, so on the one hand, you have macro global macroeconomic trends that will uh, influence heavily uh, and shape the national context of uh, transitions. Mm -hmm. Among those, we uh, mention geoeconomic fragmentation that's happening uh, 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 right now. and. Uh, even the IMF is, is talking about this uh, uh, question of geoeconomic fragmentation and its potential uh, economic implications. So that would be a factor that could both accelerate or uh, decelerate the, the low carbon transition. We'll see that after. You have the rise in renewables uh, dominance, the emergence of industrial policy as a key economic policy tool, and signs of high inflation regime that may be emerging and stay uh, alone. This all happens at the same time as the ecology crisis uh, is exac exacerbating. So let me just look a little bit more into these uh, initial status facts um, uh, more specifically. So what would be the uh, implication of the current geoeconomic fragmentation on the transition? So it's uncertain. What we, what we were saying, that it's uncertain. On the one hand, of course, less coordination, more geopolitical rivalries that tend to amplify a shortage. Yes, sorry. Sorry, I, I'm not sure what geoeconomic fragmentation is. Okay, so that's uh, basically, that can be summarized by the US-China uh, uh, geopolitical confrontation on, on the on, on all domains, but also mostly on, on the economic domain. So nothing about BRICS, something else? Well, that, I, would, I would summarizing very, very fast. <laughs> of course, BRICS play a role also in that, in the, in that game, so that's for sure, yeah. Um, so on the one hand, this geoeconomic uh, fragmentation would potentially amplify the, uh, the supply shortage risk of a a low carbon transition, but at the same time, it also pushes countries to reshore activities and develop their own uh, industrial uh, autonomy, also in the domain of the low carbon transition, which in, in this sense could also increase local manufacturing capabilities and short, shorten value chains. So that, that's, that effect would not necessarily be uh, detrimental to the, uh, to the low carbon transition. Second uh, uh, status fact is this rise in renewables dominance. So what you see in this in this uh, few graphs is the reduction of the cost in uh, photovoltaic, uh, offshore wind, onshore wind, uh, solar power, and batteries. And at the same time, below you have the ad adopt adoption rate, global adoption rate. And so you can see that in most of those technologies, uh, we are reaching tipping points where more adoption le uh, leads to more uh, uh, cost reduction, which leads to even more uh, adoption. So this, this trend is uh, accelerating uh, clearly the, at least the emergence of low carbon sectors 
not necessarily the emission reductions, because that's a more global uh, problem, but at least the emergence of these low carbon sectors. And this cost reduction that ha that's happening in the uh, big industrial centers, China, uh, uh, Europe, and uh, now also the US, has effects on all other countries by reducing the cost uh, uh, of access to these uh, uh, green technologies. So this has cross-border uh, uh, implications as well. Third stylized fact of the, of the, of the current uh, global macroeconomic trends is the emergence of industrial policies, which uh, may have also uncertain effects on the decarbonization. On, on the one hand, you could say that um, the rise of industrial policies uh, may increase the resilience of uh, region, regions or national economies to, uh, uh, to external shocks. But at the same time, if they are not really coordinated, and if, you, if it ends uh, being just a race to uh, more subsidies, uh, uh, then you, you could also have uh, lots, many regions of the world that could not follow the race, and that would uh, uh, not be able to catch up in terms of uh, technological and industrial capacities. Uh, so these are developing, of course, in the US with the, the IRA law, they probably know about. In China, it has been developed for a long time already. And then EU is kind of trying to catch up with its own uh, framework, uh, which is basically by, by trying to keep uh, this idea of uh, a free trade, WTO rules, uh, but speaking more and more still about industrial policies. Um, finally, and that's the last main uh, um, style of facts, is the high inflation regime. So why is it that important in the current, uh, the, this, this current high inflation regime that, that, that has emerged uh, just uh, recently as uh, uh, um, for the transition? So this has First, it blurs the price signal, so all the narrative about the, uh, carbon, uh, the low carbon transition being a question of carbon price is a bit less uh, credible in that environment. Uh, but also, it, it could we, it, 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 uh, it, it's, it's more difficult to uh, invest in this kind of environment, so this uncertainty context around uh, environment. But in the long run, it, it could also help absorb some of the uh, economic and financial rents from the fossil sector uh, and it spurs, it has spurred it actually more in the US than in Europe, a whole debate about price controls which could benefit uh, potentially to a uh, more like ecological planning approach to, um, the, to the low carbon transition. Um, finally, of course, the, eco the, ecological, the ecological crisis has started. It has started in everywhere, and we can see that uh, every day. And this has an impact on the low carbon transition dynamics itself. So it's hard now to completely separate uh, mitigation and adaptation issues. You have here a, a table that summarizes the potential impact of climate change on the different uh, energy sectors. Uh, including the low carbon uh, sectors and this this feedback loop of climate change on uh, on the the sectors of the low carbon transition uh, is something to to be taken to be taken into account and this is clearly also uh, a cross boundary uh, problem now let me move uh, to we, we were I was speaking about global trends that have an effect on national economies but we can also argue that national drivers of uh, the, the low carbon transition can have an effect on influence on global, uh, on global trends. Of course, the bigger the, the, bigger the country, the more effect you have on, on the global trends. But still, just to give an example, the CBAM, Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism of the European Union, uh, that's just was just started uh, very recently and that, that will uh, scale up uh, in the coming years, will have some effects on all the other regions of the world, right? And it's not clear what the effect will be. Uh, if it will be an effect in terms of accelerating, incentivizing the other regions of the world to, to kind of join the framework and uh, contribute more to the low carbon transition, or on the contrary, it could be 
that some regions of the world feel that they are trapped by this mechanism and <coughs> will kind of build their own regional coordination uh, against the CBAM. And uh, I, I, was, I didn't explain the graph before, but I, I can show you. It appears quite clearly here, for example, where you have um, the uh, emission intensity of the five sectors that are currently covered by uh, CBAM. Uh, and for the EU countries in blue and non-EU countries uh, in uh, rose, right? Uh, so what you can see here is that, that the, the countries that have the emission intensity the closest to the, the emission intensity of the European countries, they might benefit from CBAM in a way. They have, might have an interest to integrate this mechanism or to develop their own carbon price so that they don't pay the, uh, the tax for CBAM. But for those that are far uh, from, uh, from the emission intensity, so for, from the technological efficiency uh, of uh, European Union, then the cost, the, the additional investment to, uh, to catch up with this uh, technological efficiency is too big in a way, and that may, there, there may be a kind of trap uh, against uh, CBAM in that sense for, for, for some countries. Uh, yes? Am I reading this correctly that like it's, what kind of scale is it? That, does it mean that it's like even more complicated for the... It's a log scale, yeah. Yeah, okay. So, yeah. It's like um, All right, so these are just a f Let me see here. Yeah, so back to uh, the national drivers that have an impact on global trends. Um, you have uh, also the shift in be behavioral and social preferences. So for example, Europe, part of Europe, some, some countries in Europe are speaking a lot about uh, sufficiency, not really implementing it, huh? but uh, there is debate uh, in Europe or around degrowth. So whenever some, some change in behavior happens uh, in, in, in Europe or in some Euro European countries, in terms of sufficiency, this should, this will also have uh, an impact in terms of uh, the the horizon on other countries because you, it's a kind of act, act first and uh, and uh, follower uh, uh, mechanism. Uh, sufficiency policies are right, have entered the la the latest IPCC report, so then now part of the scenarios uh, that are taken into consideration officially by uh, IPCC. And you, you could think that the, this, this is also a potential beneficial in this sense, um, uh, cross-border cross -border effect of, uh, of, a, of, a, of a national uh, strategy. Now, all this can be summarized in this uh, nice uh, <laughs> figure. So uh, until very recently, or even now, we were not doing much for the, the decarbonization, but there are still emerging signals of the beginning of a transition, or at least the emergence of low carbon sectors, right? Uh, and high carbon capital being heard sometimes more and more, at least there, there's a, a change in the narrative over the, the past few years. Um, so this period here has not really been analyzed as such uh, by most models or most uh, uh, mo most analysis, right? Usually we focus too much on here, and we tend to to, to, to consider pathways that will just shift naturally sectors from from sectors to other sectors, right? But this, what is called here, mid transition period, and the, the term was invented by those two, those two here, uh, is really the 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 problem, the concrete policy uh, uh, issue that we're facing, right? And it, it seems that there are all kinds of sources of instability during this uh, mid-transition period. Some will play uh, beneficial factors, so they, they will tend to accelerate, so when you start investing in renewables, then the cost uh, is reduced, then you, you, you accelerate. But some others, and many others, will play in the other direction as well. So this is this mid-transition period that's interesting for us because this mid-transition period has lots of cross-border uh, uh, fragilities issues and that needs to be addressed specifically uh, uh, in, the, in the policy, uh, um, uh, politically, let's say. Can I ask you, Yes, sure. Uh, if 
if I remember correctly, when we were looking at the stylistics, we saw that when we talk about low carbon transition, we're not really looking at it in terms of firms going low carbon, but in terms of more sectors emerging as low carbon. Um, and then we talked about national differences in microeconomic policy also affecting the global transition mechanism. Um, are we not looking at the fact that um, if more sectors go um, low carbon, uh, we by default assume that uh, it means low cost availability to everyone for low cost, low carbon services and low carbon goods. Uh, but national differences in macroeconomic policy also mean trade bans and also mean um, non availability of low carbon goods and low carbon services to a lot of countries, especially in the global south. Um, so, how does that macroeconomic difference in the low carbon transition factor in this? Yeah, so that, that's one of these forces, actually. Uh, what, uh, the, 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 and I, I will speak about it later, but uh, this, this question of cost reduction of renewables is an accelerating factor, but it encounters many, uh, uh, many, other, many, many uh, dynamics in the other way, right? So in the global south, you need to import those technologies, mostly. Uh, and th this is costly. Uh, this can uh, uh, change your uh, external uh, constraints. You can depreciate your currency if you if you consider the transition seriously, and all these dynamics will play in the other uh, direction. So, because you will uh, experience a, de a currency depreciation, then you just will stop uh, doing the transition, and you you go in the in the other way. So that's one of those factors that could keep you potentially, and that that's but that's an, an, an hypothesis, and we need to. We need to quantify that and understand that better, but that the, this mid-transition period could actually uh, last indefinitely in a way, where you have these two systems uh, co-existing uh, and always like bumping, bu bumping into each other without, n n without the, the green one in, in, a, in a way em really emerging uh, and being completely dominant, right? with the fact that uh, just more sectors going low carbon uh, would mean low cost because for the majority of the world it means more expensive technology because technology and goods and services are concentrated in just let's say three industrial sectors of the world in, in Europe, in the US and in China but all over Africa, all over South Asia, Southeast Asia well, that, and then we will keep the question, I mean, the debate from the end. <laughs> if, it, if it's a problem of understanding, you can ask it then. Okay, we're happy to keep the debate there. On the, the technology side, they, they, they have some, some answers. Okay. Um, can I move here? Yeah. So let me move, move on to an attempt at simplifying a bit this. Uh, this nar narrative and l letting a, a form of taxonomy of cross-border risks emerge. So um, we, we propose this kind of archetype of, of countries that face uh, different types of cross-border risks in a mid-transition. So you have basically, it's very, it looks very simple, right? You have the fossil fuel exporter, the clean tech importer, clean tech importer can uh, fossil fuel exporter is clearly a, a, a loser in, in, in the game, so they will tend, will tend to resist but with all their means against the, this change. The, the clean tech importer can uh, benefit or, uh, or not, depending on the, on, the, on the context and depending on questions like, like the one you raised, right? The, both the cost of the technology but also uh, your capacity uh, to, uh, to, to import and, and, and substitute to uh, your existing system. Clean tech exporters are the, uh, the, the, the clear w uh, winners. And the critical mineral exporter, there is, this is an open question if they will replace in the global game the fossil fuel uh, uh, exporter or if they will play another kind of role, right? Because uh, the critical minerals and fossil fuels are quite different to quite different things. Also, Fossil fuels, you need them all the time, every year, uh, continuous flow uh, to let the, the fossil-based uh, economy uh, work, while the critical minerals, you kind of need them a lot at the beginning to install the capital, but then you have much less 
uh, a trade of, of these critical minerals when the, if and when the system has emerged. Um, but just simplifying the, the, the picture like this allows you to look at all the different kinds of uh, flows and relations that you might have uh, uh, between these, these countries. Of course, no country, or almost none, uh, is, can be summarized by one of this archetype. So we apply this to G20 uh, uh, economies, uh, and of course try to find some indicators of this, um, these archetypes. So looking at the critical minerals uh, net exports uh, on the y-axis and the fossil fuel net exports on the, the x-axis, and then placing the G20 economies with colors, colors indicating just the, cap the technological <coughs> capability of the country in terms of green goods. So we can have lots of discussion about what green goods uh, mean and, and redefine it better, uh, test other indicators, but that's, that's basically we took the indicators uh, done by the uh, Oxford team of, of, uh, in green complex economies and they're doing a, a job at looking at technologies by technologies, what, what's the capacity of a country, and then looking at what's the, in, if you define a green technology, what, what uh, does the country has the closest technology to this green technology and so should, should be able to produce this green technology. Um, so the, the, the picture is not so surprising that you have uh, Saudi Arabia and Russia quite um, uh, on the right hand side of the fossil fuel net export with quite limited or low uh, capabilities uh, in terms of uh, uh, green, uh, uh, green tech production. But you have Australia, South Africa uh, in the high uh, uh, critical mineral uh, uh, net exporters also with limited capacity in terms of green industrial capacity. And then you have a, a, a big uh, blob of countries where you have to d distinguish a bit uh, between, uh, between, uh, between different cases, right? You have uh, countries that have strong uh, green uh, te technological capacity so that that could kind of benefit uh, from, from a transition while being also importers uh, of uh, fossil fuels, so they will be really double, doubling down on the, the, the benefit. And some of them are also critical mineral importers. They will lose on this side, but may gain on the technological side. And some of them are also critical minerals exporters, so they, 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 they would gain uh, twice uh, on this aspect. So just by looking at the, at the D20 economies, you have the, the complexity of the transition and the different risks that might appear. Uh, both that could accelerate the transition through these countries with green technological capacity, but also uh, kind of slow down heavily uh, uh, for geoeconomic reasons uh, uh, these dynamics of a transition. Yes? Can you please explain this metric, green complexity potential, what it means? Because um, I find it confusing. All these countries export different kinds of things. Saudi Arabia is not. Exporter. It's a fuel exporter. Yes, so it's it's fossil fuel exporter. So it's uh, on the right side here, and it's red, which means it has a low green tech capacity. So green tech capacity for export or for local? Uh, actually, it's the way it's measured. It's for exporting, but it also means that you, if you can export, you can produce for yourself. Uh, we suppose that we we're in a kind of global economy environment, so you you could produce for yourself, but if you're not able to uh, compete with the rest of the world on the on the same technology, then your industry will have a problem at some point, right? So it, the data the data that are used to build this indicator are trade uh, trade data. Yeah. Even in a fossil fuel economy, Saudi Arabia is still not a technology. Well, no, no, it's, it's green technology exporter. Huh? It's not any technology. Well, the, the, the color indicates the capacity to, uh, to uh, build and export green technologies. But that is very hypothetical. That's a country that has never been any kind of technology exporter, but it has the capacity to be a green technology exporter. Yes, that's based on current data. But, I mean, sorry. Uh, that's based on current data, but uh, the, date, the current data show the type of technologies that a country uh, uh, master, right? Uh, and if 
these existing current technology that the country uh, dominates are very far from what you define as green technologies, then there is a good chance that at least in the coming years or may even decade, uh, you won't have this country emerging as a green green tech uh, uh, so power, right? So it's the it's all the green ones that are more or less here, right? Now, this indicator is not perfect for sure. And actually, there's a very recent paper by the same team that refines the indicator. Uh, so there's a lot of work ongoing on, 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 this, uh, on this green complexity potential uh, literature that's, uh, that's actually very, very interesting. All right, so based on this taxonomy now, we, we're trying to uh, list or exp explain the different channels through which this cro cross-border uh, risk might arise. And we distinguish basically between real side uh, channels, so on mostly energy sector employment and trade channels, and the more financial uh, channels, sovereign debt and, fi uh, and, 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 uh, and finance. And then we uh, conclude with some uh, policy implications. So we start from the very uh, simple picture, so what we were saying, and that not everyone agrees here, but that's, that's a trend, an existing trend. There is a, a strong cost reduction in reno, renewable uh, and some low carbon <coughs> sectors, and that leads by diffusion to cost reduction for all countries. That doesn't mean that all countries will benefit. There, there will be uh, counter uh, factors that we'll explain later, but that's the very simple uh, uh, channel, right? So that the global trend affects the uh, capacity to uh, decarbonize the domestic economy. Uh, it's less costly, so there is an incentive <coughs> at the national level to invest in, uh, in green technologies just because the cost has, uh, has, uh, has been uh, down. And this is happening in whole Europe, China, US, but also uh, you, can <coughs> s you can see that happening in India or even in, in, in South Africa sometimes. Uh, so that's one trend. But of course, that's not the whole story. And uh, you have the kind of trade feedback loop that might play against this, uh, this, uh, this channel, right? So that's what, a little bit the story that I was saying before. Uh, if you invest in just imported goods, your trade balance uh, will be uh, affected in uh, weak currency economies you need for foreign exchange reserves. That's a key uh, strategic uh, uh, policy. Uh, if you don't have uh, enough of them, then you uh, depreciate your exchange rate. And this feedbacks to uh, uh, your economy that may stop uh, your uh, willingness to invest in the low carbon transition. So that's uh, one first adverse uh, dynamics that might occur and, and that pleads in favor of this uh, hypothesis of a mid-transition trap. Now, looking at the em employment side, so you, lots of papers are, are looking at uh, the employment story uh, behind the low carbon transition, but usually it's, it's a lot uh, within countries, across sectors. Uh, so what is the content of employment uh, of new emerging sectors? Uh, how, many, uh, uh, how much employment will we lose by uh, uh, stopping the building uh, fossil fuel powered uh, cars against uh, electric cars, for example? Uh, but not too much about the uh, cross-border uh, cross uh, shift in em employment. And this is uh, a, a very important uh, cross-border aspect also of the transition. So, and uh, right now, the race, uh, the, the green industrial race that's happening uh, is about exactly about where will <coughs> these uh, jobs be uh, in the coming decades. Uh, and, and that's, that's basically a, 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 a subsidy, subsidy war for both industries, but also the, 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 the employment uh, behind, behind it. Uh, and that, in turn, affects uh, productivity growth, more investment. So when, when, you, when, you, when you manage to get, in a way, the, the, the jobs, then you get also a positive feedback look for your country, but in, uh, against other countries that will not get uh, this uh, 
um, uh, this particular plant or, or sector. Uh, now, we've tried to, uh, uh, with our co-authors and actually uh, uh, Jean-Francois Mercure, Hector Politz, who uh, are experts on the E3ME model, and uh, Jean-Francois Mosley on FTT model, try, trying to model this real side uh, aspect of the cross-border cross risks. Um, so, just a few words on this E3ME FTT model. E3ME is a macro econometric uh, model of the global economy. Uh, with uh, 71 regions, all countries, and uh, 43 industrial sectors uh, for all those regions and countries. Um, and it can, it can give uh, the evolution of uh, the, the, the major macroeconomic variables, but also the structural sectoral transformation uh, that's happening. And it has been then coupled with another model, which is called FTT which is a technology transformation uh, model on most of covering most of the sectors of the low carbon transition uh, so uh, cars solars uh, um, onshore wind offshore wind etc and with this uh, basic idea behind the model that uh, is also uh, proven in data but that that the more you adopt the technology the more the costs uh, go down and the more you adopt it. So this kind of endogenous uh, uh, aspect to uh, uh, technology uh, uh, adoption uh, is explicitly modeled here. So it's not um, a model where you set a target and optimize in a way uh, your uh, pathway to reach the target. So that's, let's say, the IPCC uh, uh, graph that I showed you at the beginning, right? That's that's the usual, uh, very standard way to, uh, to think about pathways. In, in this type of model, it's simulations. So you define the technologies as they, as they exist today, uh, how much they have been adopted by countries. And then you simulate uh, the model, simulate the adoption of those technologies, and you see which kind of uh, uh, target you reach in the end. But that, the target is not driving, uh, driving the model. Uh, so that's the, let's say, the FTT, uh, FTT part with a, a bounded ration rationality. Um, all right, so that's just, again, a summary of the different versions <coughs> of FTT, uh, different sectoral versions on power, transport, heating, and steel, and then uh, cop coupled with the E3ME uh, macroeconometric uh, model. I will, I'm not the specialist in this, but I will uh, so we skip. Um, now, this uh, FTT E3ME model is run against a well below two degrees target. So, so that, yeah. Uh, if the model is just a simulation where you reach a target, but you do not define neither the target nor the means to uh, reach it, the model does not give any advice or or incentive, or insights to what uh, should be done to change path, or to so it, it's it's not a political uh, a model that gives insights for policies. No, on the contrary, uh, uh, I would say it gives more insights <laughs> uh, for policies because in the in the model where you set a target and you optimize the structure against this target, what you end up uh, having is a form of the price of the constraint or the shadow price of carbon or the and and you end up talking just about carbon tax as the the only tool to transform the system just because mathematically the way the model is solved is by doing this optimization of the constraint <laughs> here in this case what you have is a kind of a <coughs> real life uh, economy where you can play with all kinds of different policies even carbon price as well but also uh, subsidizing s specific sectors, uh, regulations, and all kinds of other policies, and test how they affect the trajectory uh, of the model. So that's, uh, in, in that sense, it's it speaks much more to, uh, to policymakers. Um, so running this model on a, a less than two degrees scenario, uh, we wanted to look again at the, the G20 uh, countries and look at the uh, different macro indicators to see the amount of, uh, let's say, the, 
the, the, the impact of this scenario and the cross-border impact as well. So first, just looking at GDP, uh, which is not a cross-border dimension, but still it gives you an idea about who uh, loses and uh, gains in the, in the transition. And Canada is really heavily impacted. Uh, also the Russian Federation, South Africa, and the US, while some others are gaining. You can see also that the, uh, the mid-transition period plays a role because the, you have 2030, which is in uh, uh, yellow, uh, while uh, the blue, I mean, the here, this is 2050, right? Uh, so some are gaining temporarily, like uh, China. If, uh, China is here, right? China is gaining uh, in 2030, 2040, and, and a bit less in the end, at the end of the game. Um, but the, in terms of cross-border dimension, looking at trade, uh, balance. Uh, well, the picture is not so much different, but this is a purely uh, cross-border uh, measure. Uh, but having, again, Canada losing a lot, Russian Federation losing uh, enormous, much more, uh, South Africa and USA also negative, and then a few other countries uh, emerge as uh, negatively impacted. You see that China, for example, has uh, less trade in 2050. Uh, uh, although it gains in terms of GDP. So the, the cross-border dimension is diff gives a slightly different picture from the just GDP dimension. And then the energy uh, exports picture. So you basically have, again, the three, uh, our three good friends, Canada, uh, Russia, South Africa, and the US, uh, losing a lot in terms of energy exports. But what you can, what you can see, and it's more, maybe more interesting, is that globally, trade in energy shrinks a lot in 2050, right? And that's logical. You don't need, you're supposed to not, not need any more, uh, not need any more uh, fossil fuels. Fossil fuels are a heavy component of trade uh, mm -hmm. and you've replaced by uh, green technologies. So by in 2030 or something, you need more trade in critical minerals or green techs. But once this is installed, you need less of them. So that's in globally trade is le uh, there is less trade um, in 2050 when you reach uh, more or less your uh, less less than two degrees target um, now these this were the real side channels of these cross border risks but you can also complexify a bit more the picture yeah I'm sorry I did not understand what the constraint of the model is because you said that the constraint is less than two degrees yeah. And you have, uh, that is a model where you can play around with. So what are these scenarios you're projecting under which uh, parameters? Settings? Yeah, so on that, I will refer you to the annex of the paper because uh, uh, we're following the IEA two degree scenario in terms of uh, regions and countries uh, decarbonization pathways and then translating that into specific policy instruments at these regions and countries. So that in the end, you, uh, you end up in a, a less than two degrees world. But again, the, the, how it works is very different from setting a two degrees objective and optimizing the system to reach this. So that's different, yeah. I guess that uh, Russia, Canada, and US are losers because of the energy uh, exploitation that yeah. will decrease. But I also read a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, articles uh, regarding the fact that Canada and Russia, not the US, but Canada and Russia, might benefit from global warming because as they are very cold countries, uh, their, temp their temperature is actually uh, under the optimal temperature, there, there are the, the, the Arctic roads, the trade, the trade roads, the trade roads on the yeah, Arctic that true. they will uh, benefit from. The fact that they will be able to produce in a regions that are not uh, available nowadays. So I usually saw uh, Canada and Russia as the few countries that will benefit from global warming. So I'm surprised to see them as the major loser. No, no. Uh, so first, this aspect, the damages are not represented here. So you don't have uh, the impact uh, of temperature increase and other climate events on the countries. So that's not represented. Uh, then your argument about uh, optimal uh, temperature, 
uh, I know there is a lot of literature that says uh, it's uh, around 13 degrees or 14 degrees where you have uh, the maximum growth potential uh, of, a, of a country. Um, I, I don't believe too much in these papers, but in your, I mean, your, your argument in, uh, on Canada and Russia and the trade routes, that's okay. I, that I can take that, but it will be in a world that, to, to my own opinion, will be a bit completely destroyed already. So, uh, I, yeah, they may benefit in that sense, but we, we really don't know that well. <laughs> but that's not represented in, in this model, so I agree. There's no climate damage in that No. So what uh, there is a it, it has been uh, coupled with a, uh, a detailed uh, climate module, but there's not the feedback loop between the uh, so you can represent what what was the climate Im pure climate impact, but not the economic feedback of the climate change. All right, so moving to the more financial channels of this this uh, cross border risks. Um, and adding the question of public deficit and public debt. Um, and th there's different, uh, uh, di different, uh, different narratives around that, right? So uh, uh, one says that uh, the, the, the policy space of countries is very uh, uh, reduced, and so they can't uh, uh, incur more public deficit or more, pu more public debt uh, to finance the, the, the transition, and so we, we should uh, orient the strategy to attract more uh, pr private investment. But at the same time, if we believe in the story of the cost reduction of uh, low carbon investment, and that's this, this tend to be uh, at least as uh, um, economically viable as some of the fossil fuel uh, uh, oriented sectors, uh, then there should, this type of investment should pay. Uh, by itself at some point, and so temporary additional uh, public deficit might not necessarily lead to uh, more public debt in the long run. So that, that's, there, there's a debate around that. But what you could face is in the initial uh, strong public investment <coughs> might lead temporarily to public debt, but then that's enough to lead to a negative feedback loop where uh, basically uh, there is a political, a political backlash and that stops uh, uh, the dynamics of the de decarbonization. So that's, uh, that's one, one channel. Um, now, maybe more importantly, is the change that uh, a green investment wave might have on the, uh, the, the, the net international investment position of a country. And so, here I give examples from some of the work that has been done at, uh, at my former institution, IFD, um, that, that basically says, especially for some of the fossil fuel exporting countries like Colombia, uh, how uh, uh, the, um, uh, the, the net, a net zero pathway is difficult to, uh, to implement in this context, right? Because both you reduce your, uh, uh, your uh, uh, inflow of, uh, uh, of foreign uh, uh, f foreign reserves, and at the same time you're supposed to invest in the green sectors that mostly you can't produce at home, so you have to import. So you you have this double negative effect uh, that that leads to uh, a higher both a higher uh, perception of country risk for the country, uh, higher and then a higher uh, cost of capital, and then that feedbacks to the exchange rate. So for Colombia, for example. Uh, it seems that some of the net zero uh, scenarios that have been built by the Ministry of Environment are considered by the Ministry of Finance as completely uh, impossible for macroeconomic reasons uh, to, uh, uh, to follow. And, and, and this constraint is not, has not been put at the core of the, of the, let's say, climate transition debate mostly. Uh, or, uh, but but it's, it's one of the, of the strongest factors that could uh, lead to uh, uh, stop, uh, stop any uh, transition dynamics and stop the, even the adoption of uh, uh, green, uh, uh, green technologies. Um, one of the, one of the uh, uh, important uh, factors that's always mentioned is also the higher cost of capital uh, for uh, developing emerging economies compared to uh, uh, 
US or, or, or Europe, etc., which is, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, completely true. And this is all the more amplified by the current uh, uh, monetary policy tightening that's happening. So the raise of, inter of interest rates just deepen uh, even more uh, the, the cost of the, the increase even more the cost of, of capital uh, for these economies. And as green tech are much more capital intensive than fossil tech, uh, then the, this just shifts even more against uh, the adoption of green technologies. So against this, I mean, that's, I think, for the debate, really, uh, lo uh, lots of uh, proposals and talks about uh, green financial sector interventions or reform of the global, uh, global financial architecture. I leave that for after. Um, okay, so conclusion of the, I don't know how much time I have, but yeah. Conclusion of the, um, uh, the presentation. So first, we try to identify the characteristics of a mid-transition period at the global scale, both in terms of technology, trade, and financial domains. Um, we show that the global macroeconomic context plays an amplifying role in all these uh, cross-border uh, risks. We list these macro, uh, global macroeconomic uh, trends, geoeconomic fragmentation, rise in uh, renewable dominance, emergence of industrial policies, and possible shift, still to be confirmed, but to a high inflation regime, not, not just a temporary uh, uh, high inflation, but a, a more structural uh, high inflation regime. And of course, all that happening uh, at the same time as uh, the ecological crisis deepens. Uh, we propose a kind of very simple taxonomy uh, <coughs> to illustrate this cross-border risks, and we apply it to G20 uh, economies. And then we outline a general framework to analyze the different channels one by one with some uh, that have been already kind of analyzed. We reference to the li literature on that. We simulate a specific scenario for the real side uh, of these uh, uh, cross-border channels. And we discuss also the financial side uh, of these cross-border uh, channels. So in the end, the transition looks like a uh, much even more difficult uh, uh, pathway uh, because you, you would have to navigate uh, these different uh, pot potential forces that would uh, push you back. Uh, even there, there are a few of them that could push you also uh, forward. So that's, we have to admit that. But lots of those are uh, uh, pushing you back. And they have not been analyzed as such, as forces that push you back to uh, uh, to, where, to where you were before starting the transition. Um, so what are the policy implications, let's say, for this? So here, we're not very original, so we could have much uh, richer discussion on this. But basically, this should be the topic of the policy discussion, right? So when you go to a, a, a COP, there's no, no talks about that, nothing. And when you go to a G20 or, uh, or uh, the UN or, uh, or let's say uh, IMF and World Bank, you have, it's just starting maybe, but uh, it, it's, it's not the core of the, uh, of the issues around uh, uh, global coordination. So much more emphasis on this cross-border dimension of transition uh, dynamics uh, should be uh, put in all these different arenas. There, there is need to refine much more so the indicators. We have this very simple G20 uh, uh, graph and with the green complexity uh, uh, measurements, but you, you could analyze this uh, with much more refined indicators and much more systematic indicators of this cross-border risk as well. Uh, and we represented in a kind of separate way the real side of the cross-border channels and the financial side of the cross-border channels, but ideally you would want to represent them together, right? But such a model doesn't exist yet. Uh, you have lots of real side sector uh, models at the global scale with different regions and, and sectors. You have some country level uh, models with uh, endogenous financial uh, flows that are represented, but not, not at the global scale. So they, they cannot have a narrative uh, 
they, they, can, they cannot push this kind of narrative, integrated narrative at the global scale. And then open questions maybe for the debate. What uh, role for the financial regulation and international safety nets to mitigate these cross-border risks? Uh, as would emerging markets, developing economies, uh, face a critical material resource curse as well? So is, is this an emerging issue? Or will there be the new uh, Saudi Arabia of, uh, of the net zero world? Uh, and we will face more uh, international policy cooperation as a consequence or more fragmentation. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, if you have a... No, I think she has. Yeah, yeah. Oui, je C'est le micro une à une pour moi. Euh, parce que ça, je pense que ce sera pas bien avec ça. Ce ça sera, ça sera mieux avec ça. Quoi. presentation of the discussion of this paper. Uh, thanks for this broad discussion first. Uh, in this paper, it is uh, has been discussed a very crucial issue. We can deny that uh, we are in the face of the world where we need to take a step for, uh, for the change of the climate. So we need the investment in green infrastructure, but uh, simultaneously we can deny what already existing in our uh, economy system like the high carbon infrastructure. 
so in this paper uh, the uh, this crucial things has been discussed that what are the challenges is going to be face the uh, world economy and also what kind of volatility and instability is going to be faced and uh, there they have also showed the challenges and also uh, the policies and uh, here uh, in this uh, paper they have made a good linkage about the countries they, uh, those are facing this type of uh, risk first of all um, they focus on the g20 countries who has uh, the the characteristics of the countries dependent on the ability of their um, high carbon material production and consumption pattern and also their technological capabilities to produce low carbon technology uh, on the other hand their ability to produce use the renewable energy the most interesting fact about this paper is that they have uh, also given in, uh, importance on the policy coordination like uh, that uh, the author has mentioned that um, fossil fuel exporter are in vulnerable position <coughs> but uh, due to policy the scenario can be different like uh, fossil fuel importer can also have some changes in their trade balance if they increase their import of uh, high carbon technology because of the low price uh, because of the decarbonization and also the um, uh, exporter um, may can have change uh, in their economy by domestic diversification of their economy so uh, in this case if there are some changes in the policy coordination then the whole situation can be flipped um, and here the uh, micro and macro economic impact of this uh, cross-border risk so uh, here they have mentioned that um, because of the changes uh, from the high carbon sector to the uh, low carbon sector uh, there has some impact on the employment because uh, the green tech and uh, low carbon um, sector don't need that much maintenance and operational cost so in the long run uh, it is going to be capital intensive so it is not going to create that much employment but also it has something that uh, if the number of the employment is higher that is going to be lost because of the uh, changes then ultimately it can be a solution but uh, uh, we are really uh, in a uh, big dilemma whether it is really possible because um, as uh, in the paper we have seen that uh, because of this transition because of the uh, green uh, uh, green uh, movement the uh, maintenance cost and the operational cost cost are really low so how it will be possible and also they have uh, made a good um, linkage with the public acceptance because of the um, low employment creation and job loss and also the uh, loss of the foreign direct investment and also um, and the uh, problem that is going to come from the debt because of uh, using the uh, foreign currency uh, uh, this is a good linkage, but uh, we, uh, we would be more um, uh, glad if we could get some picture of the uh, stock market. Uh, we have seen that uh, in the paper there, there has been shown some volatility in the stock market, but uh, the problem is that um, like the policy coordination that uh, we have uh, seen uh, that it uh, the whole situation can be flipped like uh, in the stock market when the investors are demanding high return from the high uh, carbon locking uh, uh, companies uh, so uh, the, the um, shareholders may be motivated to invest those companies who are really high carbon locked in uh, because of the high return so it may be a possible trade also and uh, on the very last part of the paper, uh, there were some uh, proposal for financing uh, these types of green initiatives without um, without having external uh, debt vulnerability uh, about the green uh, spatial drawing rights and also resilient sustainability trust. Um, by the IMF but uh, in that paper we are really lacking uh, those parts that uh, what are the success of this proposal because uh, in some um, article it had been a uh, critic that these types of facilities are given to the G20 countries but we also have to think about the low and middle income countries those are also vulnerable to this situation so uh, it would be uh, better if we could get more broad perspective in this uh, segment thank you from my part now uh, with you will take uh, so now we move on with some uh, more commentary on the papers, the model in general. And uh, what stood out to us the most uh, 
from the beginning is that it's a very comprehensive model and a very comprehensive paper in the sense that it considers a lot of different factors but also the reality of, of a lot of different countries in uh, different conditions. And what's interesting is that uh, throughout these debates we've been doing a point that is often criticized in uh, models of ecological transition is that they often fail to take into account the reality of developing countries and how differently they are affected by this process. And this wasn't the case here, so it was definitely a strong point in our perspective. At the same time, because it's accounting for so many shifting factors and uh, trying to um, make them work together to come up with uh, this cross-country uh, cross risks, it's also leaving a lot of room for uncertainty in terms of the inputs it's taking and uh, particularly when it comes to uh, political factors and social, social dynamics. So all of these limitations, they are very well recognized in the paper and it's often said uh, how these factors could bring uncertainty to the model, but for the sake of commentary, we thought it would be interesting to bring some of these points for debate. Uh, for example, here we have some points in which uh, economics and politics um, could possibly affect the way the, um, the transition happens in this moment. And the first point is the assumption that the transition will remain in its current path. So it feels like there's this underlying assumption in the model that uh, what are the current trends of transition and decarbonization will be uh, somewhat continued in the future, which is something that is very susceptible to change um, according to some political dynamics. One of those is that of deglobalization, which again is mentioned in the paper, but what's interesting to see here is how this is not an exclusively economic process, but something that is very closely related to politics and to the rise of economic nationalism. Um, also related to this, there's also a question of what, to, what, to what extent disruptions can be understood as exceptions in the model, like for example when you talk about uh, the conflict in the Ukraine, and to what extent it's actually a trend that is related to um, more general um, more general situations and uh, also related to this there's the question of public perception of the climate crisis and overall public demands for decarbonization and um, related to this the extent to which developing nations will be able to prioritize decarbonization uh, at the same level as the rest of the world and uh, interestingly, this relationship also goes both ways. So at the same time that there's political factors affecting the way um, the, the transition will have economical consequences, uh, there's also possibilities to look at what, how, this eco sorry, <laughs> how this economic effects will create political tension. So one of them, as you mentioned, uh, was the case of the curse of natural resources in the transition and how it will pose political challenges to countries that are rich in these uh, crucial minerals and also the consequences of political instability for oil exporting countries, particularly those that are uh, heavily dependent on these exports. So to illustrate these last two points, two examples we can think of are that of the coup d'etat in Bolivia in 2019, which is very much linked to the external interest in lithium in the country, and the case of Nigeria with the oil industries and uh, the challenges it will face with export diversification in a scenario of reduced demands for, uh, for oil. And with this, we go on with uh, this part. Thank you. So, to finish, uh, we wanted to give an example of possible conflict between um, a local content retirement and um, a global regime trade. <laughs> and so, um, some country wants to uh, build green industries and they can do that uh, to then use locally or to be traded. And uh, sometimes they can do that with local content requirements. And uh, they create a fundamental, they can, so, can create a uh, fundamental conflict between political economy of domestic renewable energy support and uh, basic principles of uh, global trade regimes. And this is uh, what happened between um, Canada and Japan in 2010. So uh, Canada implemented Fed in tariff programs for wind and solar energy, but um, Japan claimed that it was not respecting existing trade agreements and um, so they initiated bilateral consultation with Canada over the tariff. And in the end, uh, the panel sided with Japan and most of their claims. And Canada uh, had to bring this program into compliance. And so this is to show that um, 
sometimes even if country wants to have a green industries, it's not implemented in the end because of conflict between uh, local content requirements and uh, trade regimes. And to finish, uh, when we read the article, one question came to our mind, and it is what is the role of interdisciplinary and qualitative studies in bridging the gap between political factors and economic models of the transition? So thanks, thanks for the nice, uh, nice comments. Um, I just just have a few uh, few reactions on the the SDR uh, story. Uh, I, I, I agree that uh, the current uh, uh, current uh, institutional uh, setting for SDRs is strongly uh, bi biased against uh, uh, in favor of of, of uh, the richest countries. Um, but that's the uh, still the only existing tool uh, that looks a little bit like uh, uh, a, a global common currency, and uh, and there are l loads of propositions that uh, and actual uh, existing uh, existing tools that also redistribute SDRs from uh, from uh, rich uh, economies to uh, uh, to low-income countries and, uh, and and developing economies. Uh, it's not not at all at, at scale, and there is the problem of conditionality. Uh, so there are lo lots of issues behind behind that. But uh, and and I, I fully uh, agree with those uh, those comments. Um, yeah, I think uh, on the, on the second type of uh, comments, you just uh, uh, enriched the the initial picture, right? So that, that you you kind of. Uh, Develop more gave examples of some of those factors that that would could lead to a, a, what we call a mid transition trap in in our case, uh, and I I think that mostly uh, the paper is also a little bit about political economy, so it's not just purely uh, showing uh, um, economic trends behind that the the. These feedback loops are, have all a, a form of political economy explanation, right? Mm -hmm. So you you took more the angle of political economy, and we took a bit more maybe the the, the, the angle of uh, just an economic analysis, but um, they are not incompatible at all. Um, yeah, no, I I think I agree <laughs> with with all the other comments. Uh, uh, to what extent uh, would disruptions uh, uh, be not the exception but the rule? I think that's the model also of the mid-transition mid trap. It's, it's, a, it's a kind of system, it's a regime, because it lasts for a long period of time, uh, but with no, uh, with permanent disruption is in one direction or the other for, 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 for different reasons. And so we, we can't say now that, that this will happen, right? It needs more... Uh, it, need, it needs more, not only argument, but also quantitative uh, an, a analysis. But that's uh, also a hypothesis we cannot rule out, that we'll enter uh, this permanent period, or almost permanent period, uh, where the two systems will, will uh, coexist in a conf conflictual way. Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's it. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know if I have to distribute the... <laughs> so there is one here and one here. Uh, I'm John from Colombia. Uh, I have a question, like, what could be, like, the potential cross-border risk implication of stranded assets? Um, do you think that uh, they can lock or actually they can lock the transition because they can be potentially kind of financial stability, instability or not? Um. So I'm not I'm not sure I fully understand. What what is the cross border dimension of stranded assets? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, for a country like Colombia, exporting uh, fossil uh, fuel, uh, if its assets become stranded. Uh, it, it comes from a cr cross-border aspect, right? Because the it's, it's because the demand uh, will shift, right? So that's 
cross-border almost by definition. Uh, so I, I think that's the, the key, uh, the one argument. But you, it, it seems to me at least that uh, the debate has been on understanding uh, what is the amount of stranded assets potentially in the world, uh, how much uh, reserves or, or resources should be uh, uh, should stay in the ground, uh, but not this cross-border dimension that has its own uh, specific macroeconomic uh, uh, properties, right? Well, actually, I have to go back to one of the questions that Jean asked earlier. Um, uh, there, there was one here as well, sorry. <laughs> but, uh, I have a very different question. You said at the beginning that like, this mid-transition period is uh, characterized by conflict, in this case by two different types of sectors. In my head, it also, like, especially if we look more into the future, like there will be societal conflict. So like, do you, like, at, at what point do we include like, societal, like, social change or social institution and the change of social institutions on like the economy into these models, and is that even something that one can attempt? Like, like, or is that something that's just out of the realm of these kind of models? Um, can you define what a suicidal uh, I would, suicide like, is? I would assume that, like, given that, like, when we see that like, climate change like will become worse in like twenty to thirty years, that then there will be not only economic effects, but also through the channel of like democracy uh, scrambling, and then that will have effects on the economy as well. Like, I should know that it's very hard to predict, but it is something that I feel is hard to exclude from these predictions as well. Like, is there some kind of midway? Yeah, okay, so I, I understand. So I think it, it it's clearly out of the scope of what, what I, I, I talked about. Uh, now it's a very interesting point to, to see as what, what's the political landscape of uh, a worsening climate change, right? So we have lots of arguments saying that uh, uh, we'll have a, a stronger right, right party becoming more and more uh, uh, climate denialists uh, mm -hmm. or, uh, or even yeah, kind of climate denialist fascist uh, tendency. Uh, that's uh, Andreas Malm's uh, uh, take. Uh, so I, I, I I'm no specialist in in that for sure, but I think that yeah, that's very relevant debates in general. Yeah, and you you can see flavors of this happening right now in Europe. Yeah. Leo's question actually reminds me of uh, if we can also factor in uh, a possible scenario of migration because of climate anxiety and also um, the possibility of conflict because those are both very predictable and very near future kind of scenarios which seem very reasonable to talk about and of course it's not like just about this model but about any uh, economy ecology climate economy models uh, which fails to talk about the possibility of especially the people from developing countries who can afford to migrate to countries where the impact of climate change is possibly delayed or or where there is provision for technology availability or um, adaptability for for better living standards and also just the question of um, in the mid-transition, uh, the majority of the world facing um, not low cost, but high cost green technology, um, which kind of makes me want to question the predictions that this model would give us because G20 is a very small sample <coughs> and constitutes of very few developing countries. Um, I mean, off the top of my head, what I can remember is there's South Africa, there's um, India, maybe two other countries, but China. every other country is a developed country, or at least a, uh, above the upper middle income country bracket. And um, for every other country which is not one of these countries, green technology is not low cost. Um, so how does that factor into changing the predictions of this model? Okay, so 
I think you you mentioned two things. So one one about migrations, they are not included there, and that's uh, clearly a potential cross-border risk if we consider migration as, as a risk. Uh, but uh, the most I think most of the studies so far also shows that the migration that have happening the, the, us a lot south south related to related to climate change and the causality is always very difficult to assess as well um, and uh, and so yeah th this topic again is, is, is difficult to, to handle it's lots of migration happening south south so mentioning them as a one huge cross uh, one, one huge risk for northern economies is, is a kind of bit dangerous as well right because we have no strong evidence of this happening now but at the same time, you kind of raise the fear without evidence of uh, this happening and, and create a whole, uh, a whole uh, interesting political debate. Uh, the, um, on the other point, uh, technologies, that's, that's also an important point. Uh, we, there is not, in the, in the current version of the model, there is not explicitly the different cost of access to capital from different countries and regions of the world. So that's a, a strong, uh, a strong limitation, and that will that will, will change the, the results. And that's something we're working on right now, because it's, it's doable even in this uh, in this model to add this. Uh, and then you will see uh, what happens uh, uh, for a, a country that uh, has a, a high country risk. Uh, uh, and, and, and the weak currency, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that increased a lot, uh, the cost of uh, capital and then the cost of these green technologies. If I could follow up on your migration point, um, even if it is south-south and not south-north, yeah. and it raises the question of um, the north-south power dynamics and people in the north talking about people in the south as, as a classics issue, I completely get that, but even if we talk about South-South migration, uh, let's say for a country like India, I'm from India, and even for a country like India, uh, we have migration from all of South Asia into India, and as a South country, having migrants from other South, South yeah. countries uh, inevitably increases pressure on resources, pressure on land, and makes the, yeah. the middle-level transition elongated and also more costly. So no, no, but that, I, I don't deny the, the importance of the topic. I'm just saying, what I, from what I, what I know, because I'm no specialist in this, it's a lot is internal migration, then south-south, and on the evidence for, for migrations due to climate change uh, south-north is, is limited. What you're saying is, is completely so right. Yeah. Talk about it. Like no, no. When somebody is migrating, you only ask them, why are you seeking a visa? And that is for a job, or it is to have access to healthcare. Yes. It's never about, hey, the climate in my country is bad, and I would like. Yeah, yeah, that's that's people. highly possible. Yeah, I don't need deny that. Yeah, so that, that's uh, another good point. So it's true that in the, the history, if you look at past energy transition, we will say there's, there's never been a real energy transition. It was always energy additions. Uh, we have not less uh, coal after uh, oil started, right? Uh, but what, what you see still is a complete shift in the role of these different energy sources, right? So wood as a source of energy, then wood keeps being important, but it's not anymore a source of energy. It's, it's used in other sectors that are part of the coal-powered uh, 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 economy. And then again, uh, when, when oil enters, coal play, plays a, a different role in the economy. So it's, just, it's a uh, structural shift still. 
but that's true that on aggregate it's an addition so we have never experienced an energy transition so mm -hmm. that's that, that that's clear but this is what what needs to happen yeah i can't say more than that <laughs> me very difficult questions huh? <laughs> no no what, what I can just say is that maybe uh, there are in the long run there has always been a link also between the key currency and the energy regime right so coal was the time of uh, uh, British Empire uh, and oil uh, more of the US dominance now the question is what happens next right uh, and no one really knows uh, you have China is uh, is a power in both dependent, heavily dependent on coal, but also mastering all the all the new emerging uh, technologies and all the supply chain for these technologies. So maybe it's it's the new hegemon, or maybe we manage to build something that doesn't rely on a, on a new hegemon, right? Uh, <laughs> that's uh, the SDR option, but I, I I understand it's weak at this stage. exposed to international pressure than the reverse um, instrument. If it's a demand led model, then there would be no problem uh, basis on doing public debt, I imagine. So, so uh, SDRs <laughs> are not uh, debt instruments. So that's a bit different, right? So the, the special drink rights, they are used in, in a kind of in a liquidity crisis, for example. Uh, uh, they can use, be used as reserves. Uh, uh, to uh, to mitigate this uh, this crisis by by countries, they can be used also as a, uh, an investing instrument in a way. So you have uh, the resilience and sustainability trust at the IMF. That's uh, uh, I think that's 50, uh, 50 billion or, or even a bit more uh, uh, SDR uh, there that uh, uh, are serve as uh, for investing in countries that are in need uh, of uh, liquidity, of, of, of liqui emer emergency liquidities. So it's, n it's not the same as debt instruments. The current question that many countries are facing is uh, debt restructuring. Uh, so it's, uh, well, uh, forgiving the par part or, <laughs> or ev everything of their, uh, of their debt because they can't repay it. So the, the ongoing negotiations are between uh, let's say G7 or Paris Club countries and China, usually with the, this, these countries. Uh, and there are lots of proposals and actual uh, uh, policy implementation of debt for nature swaps or debt for climate swaps. So this kind of instrument mm -hmm. is a kind of, uh, yeah, uh, transferring the, the debt burden into some climate or nature related action. And, but these instruments, I mean, it's, it's interesting to analyze, but they have uh, their own limitations as well. Yeah. My name is Stefan, and I'm from Denmark. Uh, I'm going to follow up on what I asked you about in the yeah. break there. See, I'm interested in the validity of your results of your model, basically. Yeah. I want to know if it's like just basically built on conjecture, or if you've tested the model on, like, back-tested it, you know, and how, what, what is the stability of the outputs that you get from your model? These are the types of questions that I'm interested in because, I mean, 
honestly, anybody can create a model, but there's not a lot of like substantiating evidence that this model is implicit thoroughly. So like, have you gone 10 years back and then implemented into the model and then seen if it then resulted in the reality of the, of the, of the things that we've already done? Like, does it, does it back test well? Does it, does it adequately like actually show the environment as it is or is it just purely a political model? <laughs> uh, so uh, first, I'm not a uh, contributor to the, to the modeling exercise yeah. myself. It's a, it's a, there's a whole team that has been working for, I think, 15 or 20 years on this uh, E3ME uh, uh, model at Cambridge Economics. Um, and just what I can say, but that's that will be quite high level for, for you. For, for you. It's, it's macroeconomic, macroeconomic model. So by definition, it, it means that it's, this, it's estimated over the, the past period. So there is then certainly uh, uh, s some uh, uh, back testing uh, of, the, of the, the estimation itself so over, over a period of time. That's the standard way to build this, uh, this kind of a macroeconometric uh, model. Then it's uh, the FTT part, which is the technological change module, is back tested as well on each uh, technology uh, because they basically it eats lots of lots of data, right? So this this uh, this uh, technological uh, module, uh, so it, it's checking all the time if what was forecasted is actually happening, right? And uh, right now uh, there are they, uh, just a. I think a week or two ago, there was an announcement that uh, China uh, was going to peak on emissions much earlier than, than uh, predicted. Uh, and that was also uh, indicated on FTT. But then I'm, I'm also not the, the, the original contributor to an FTT model. So that's all what I can say at, uh, at this stage. And the other, the other point is it has been used uh, I mean, it's not a political model. It's 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 been used for policy uh, purpose by the European Commission, and and for by many other uh, uh, countries as a tool for policymakers to look at uh, different policy options. I don't. That's I a partial. How, how, how useful it is in actual predicting. So if you actually did follow the model and if you've been using it, then you must now be able to go in and say, yeah. okay, we're going to take the data from the given point in time, and then we're going to implement, and then you can like average the difference between how good your model is actually at predicting it, yeah. like training set, test data set, you know, yeah. and yeah. then you can actually have a look at that. And that was generally what I was a little bit curious about. Like, and then it was more like, are you, are you going to maybe uh, make such a test and maybe like uh, publish the results of that test? So you have tons of publications uh, of the e 3 model that you can find uh, on, the, on the Cambridge Economics page that, that describe all the how the model is built, yes, what kind I of testing that, has been done. But uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> I can't say more than that, sorry. <laughs> I'm actually, yeah. But if you have more questions, I can put you in no, contact to, uh, yeah. with, the, with, the, with the team. Okay. Hi, I'm Sonja from Germany, and I have more of a general or practical question. That is, how does your research relate to your experience as a World Bank economist? Like, what insights that you gained in that research do you feel are properly addressed by or within the World Bank, which are more lacking? Are you generally happy with how the World Bank addresses cross-border risks? <laughs> so if I'm happy at the World Bank, that's the question. <laughs> Specifically about how it addresses cross-border risks. Do you have to talk about your personal experience? <laughs> um, so, so far on... Uh, no, no, I will make a serious uh, answer. So the, the, the World Bank is, uh, is working on, uh, has been working on climate issues for a long time. That was the Sustainable Development uh, uh, Department. And then just for the last two years, it's building a lot of, it's putting a lot of energy in building uh, national level uh, reports on climate change and climate policy issues. It's called the Climate Change Development Reports. And uh, it means every five, four or five years, all countries uh, will have this kind of assessment of where they are in terms of the, of the low carbon transition in all dimensions. It's true so far, not including too much the cross-border dimension, which is a comment that I've, made, I've been making uh, many times uh, uh, during the reviewing process of those reports, but it's work in progress as well, uh, to be honest. Uh, 
it's it's done with a very limited amount of time with actually limited resources and for uh, 200 countries which is a just a huge task so you have your answer <laughs> similar question because last week we had a speaker who basically said that he went into economic modeling because that is as soon as you put a model on a scenario it becomes policy relevant that was a little bit his mm -hmm. like it, you can you can more easily be um, understood by policy makers okay. and at the same time I feel like we are entering a future that is almost not modelable anymore um, because the fact that this doesn't take in climate damages feels a bit strange to yeah. me. So I was wondering if you were willing to reflect, like, do you believe in the scenario that the model is based on? And how do you, yeah, how do you politically answer that? If you understand what you mean? So, uh, uh, two, two types of response. I think the paper is broader than what the model is showing. It's okay. just one part of the paper. Uh, and so I believe in the overall narrative. Okay. Uh, the model is uh, an attempt at showing some uh, limited uh, sets of the, <coughs> the questions that are raised by the paper. And no, uh, we sh n no, no one should really uh, believe uh, a, mo a model, right? So it's, uh, it's just a tool to uh, Put the hypotheses on the table and discuss them. It's it's not. But it's based on a two degrees world. Yes, but which is not necessarily what policy, like implemented policies, are now predicting. Really. Uh, no, yeah, no, no. So, so it's again, it's just like if it's a, it's if always an if, if exercise the model, right? Uh, and <coughs> you shouldn't, uh, you should never. Uh, uh, trust a model t to tell you uh, what to do or, or the truth. It's it's just a tool to uh, to make the debate a bit more structured and uh, and quantitative. But that's it. Uh, but certain scenarios are not cannot be modeled. And I agree. That's why it's it's just a tool. It's not all the tools. No, yeah, I agree. No. Is, no. Weird, no? Like so I uh, <laughs> so, so for example, central banks have been building. Uh, uh, models and uh, scenarios of climate change uh, and now they are supposed to all implement the same s use the same scenarios to uh, uh, to do some uh, stress testing of uh, their financial uh, system uh, but there are strong problems in the in the current uh, scenarios that are used uh, and the models that are used to, to uh, illustrate those scenarios so that some central banks uh, Chile for example is just trying to uh, have, have a completely different approach without any model. Also knowing that in case of a crisis or emergency, you, you don't uh, wait for the, uh, for the simulation from a DSG model to tell you what to do. And, and so creating more of a uh, narrative approach to decision making uh, in the face of uh, climate shocks and climate crisis. But even this, okay, it's not a model, it doesn't use a, R or Python, but uh, <laughs> but it's still a form of a structured story that that needs to be made, right? Yeah. So I'm, I'm Celso from Portugal, and um, my question focuses on a well, fairly lateral point in the presentation, as it, it was really on the side of the, the board. That is considering the um, paper that the critical resource, the critical resource-rich developing countries. Um, that they're going to have in, in, in all this. Uh, uh, particularly in a world that is acutely aware of the importance of safeguarding those, of safeguarding those resources for their respective spheres of influence, be it China, America, the EU. Um, do you think that th that will in any way end up uh, as a good thing for those countries, especially concerning that the great powers have learn their lessons concerning the oil shocks, the oil shocks in the 70s? Yeah, again, difficult <laughs> question for me. Um, no, I think uh, you have tons of examples in both directions, right? With uh, countries managing to control their own resources or even uh, onshore some of the uh, uh, supply chain beyond the, the resource extraction. And, and there are like flavors of that uh, from the 
I think that was mentioned, the, the, the lithium uh, conglomerate uh, in Latin America that, that, that could be emerging. Uh, so that's an attempt, an attempt at uh, uh, imposing this control, national, regional control on key resources. Uh, but it's true that this would be a, this would be a political and may, maybe not even so political uh, uh, tension, right? So some countries will not manage to uh, uh, to, 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 to really uh, take control over their uh, critical resources. So okay, you you can have the resource curse. And then, and then just get stuck on yeah. the there is another risk as there, there is another another risk as well. I think for uh, critical uh, minerals is that just. Uh, technology will shift also away from uh, s some some of those critical minerals that are not critical minerals anymore, because the technology would have shift, uh, and 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 then then you you would have invested a lot there, and and, and you end up uh, having a stranded assets as well. You have already battery without lithium emerging. Right? So. Question? Uh, yeah. uh, I'm here. Name and country. Please? Name and country. No, I'm from Togo. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> US Africa. So, uh, my question is about uh, the question of uh, the global transition. Uh, if we think, uh, in the presentation, we talk about uh, the case of Nigeria, who uh, the, uh, is a uh, 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 as an uh, or I mean exportation, uh, fifty percent percent of its uh, uh, exportation is based in the so, so oil, yeah. and uh, I mean the reputation <coughs> in the consumption or international utilization of uh, uh, oil uh, that would mean that the demand of oil will decrease in the uh, future years, and also uh, since uh, the good part of uh, its exportation is based on oil, that means it will face also the problem of. Uh, uh, currency uh, exchange rates. So I hope that will damage more the these countries' uh, economies. And also, uh, uh, I mean, uh, for these countries who, uh, for World Bank uh, uh, status, uh, their population will double uh, uh, in 20 years. Uh, that means uh, the problem of global transition will not uh, cause uh, any problem like uh, uh, increasing of po poverty in the world because uh, if the, these po countries are, will face the problem of uh, 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 financial uh, and uh, the case of Nigeria who since uh, 2015 uh, its uh, currency Naira is continuing uh, falling in, uh, to dollar and uh, now the, the country is facing uh, economic and financial problem and uh, this will also increase the poverty in the country I mean uh, the question of uh, 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 global transition through the uh, I don't know how to say in this <laughs> in fact je dirais que la question de la transition de la transition uh, ne Ça, est-ce que ça devait, ça devait primer sur la question de la réduction de la pauvreté C'est ce que c'est ce que je voulais demander. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, no, I'm, I'm not, certainly not saying this. Uh, I don't think uh, Ni Nigeria, as such, is contributing so much to global emissions, right Yes. Uh, and uh, most of uh, Western Africa is certainly not contributing uh, uh, to uh, to global emissions. So it shouldn't be. Uh, uh, priority on uh, poverty reduction, but the the important thing to uh, understand, but I don't have uh, the res uh, definite uh, response, is if the country develops in a certain uh, fossil-based system, mm -hmm. we, maybe it will face in ten years, twenty years. Mm -hmm. uh, well, again, stranded assets having developed in the in the kind of wrong technological pathways. Mm -hmm. So that's the that that the hypothesis that that that, that we should uh, investigate. I think um, maybe it's cheaper somehow uh, now, but it could be like it 
could end, end up being stuck uh, in a fossil, fossil regime when the rest of the world or the, uh, let's say, the major economies would, would have shifted. And sadly, they kind of define the technological frontier. So uh, th that, that, that's the risk I see. So for Nigeria, uh, Nigeria is, I don't think it produces the cheapest oil in the world, right? So I think the, the, the latest country that will uh, export oil will be Saudi Arab Arabia, most probably. Uh, so no, Nigeria, Nigeria would stop exporting before uh, Saudi Arabia uh, stops, right? So in, in, in this sense, uh, it's not necessarily a good strategy to, uh, uh, to keep to bet everything on uh, on uh, keeping uh, uh, fossil e fossil exports for Nigeria, mm -hmm. so there is a, of course there is a kind of a inevitable uh, trade-off. Uh, I don't say it's super easy. Since so. uh, uh, globally the demand of oil will decrease, yeah. that means that uh, the exportation of Nigeria will also decrease. Uh, if we take the case of uh, oil that is uh, yeah. eighteen percent of its uh, exportation, yeah. so. And also, uh, I read that uh, uh, it's uh, uh, government's uh, uh, resources, uh, uh, 16% come from all uh, exportation. So, uh, how can this country, uh, I mean, reduce the problem, uh, face the problem of reduction of poverty? And also, since we know that Nigeria is not an uh, uh, industrialized country, who like China or, or India who will produce uh, 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 renewable uh, uh, energy. So that means that uh, you will, uh, they will leave all their resources and uh, how, to, to, uh, how they will use to finance their economies. Yeah, I mean, there, there's a, I don't, again, I don't have the answer. So what I can say, there's certainly a need for diversification, but that's very difficult at the country level. So mm -hmm. it should be thought at the regional.